Jane Velez Mitchell for Unchained TV. We have an extraordinary panel to cover the open rescue trial of Baywatch actress Alexandra Paul and her co-defendant. Um, you are going to see right now the intro to this trial, which is the actual alleged crime, which the defendants call an open rescue, caught on tape. I'm proud to be going on trial facing a theft charge for rescuing sick, suffering birds from a foster farm slaughter truck. I spent five years starring on the television series Baywatch, playing a lifeguard who saved lives. And today, I save lives in real life as an animal cruelty investigator. My name is Alexandra Paul. I've been in over 100 movies and television shows. But the thing I'm most proud of is my work rescuing animals from factory farms and slaughterhouses. Wow. You know, uh, Dotsie Bausch, you are personal friends with Alexandra Paul. You do a podcast together. Where does she get the guts and the gumption to do these kind of open rescues where she ends up getting arrested and put on trial? I, I, don't, I don't know. It, it, she's so extraordinary. She really is one of the most extraordinary people I know. And when I talked to her uh, a few, few days ago, she told me that she was offered five deals uh, in this case, and she turned them all down um, because she said the point is to tell the chicken stories, not to win or lose. It's to establish a precedent of a right to rescue. And she is standing strong and firm and brave, as is Alicia. And uh, they, as, as we all know, they, they uh, stand to um, serve maybe six months in jail. Wow. It is so scary to consider that let's yeah. take a look now at the rescue itself which authorities are calling a crime Nathan Semmel, former Manhattan District Attorney, describe this case for us. What is the legal issue at stake? I think the legal issue here is, was a theft committed or was there a rescue? If it's a theft then and a jury finds that, then it's a crime. That's the prosecution's theory. Obviously, that's Foster Farms' theory. I think anybody with a heart looks at this case, looks at the situation. If you look at what Alexandra and Alicia knew about Foster Farms and what those chickens were going through on the truck and what they were about to endure, how do you see it anyway but a rescue? And that's what I think a jury is going to be called upon to decide. Um, Donnie Moss, you are a longtime activist who has done many, many sit-ins and demonstrations, but um, correct me if I'm wrong. Have you been arrested? What is it like to go through something like this? Well, um, I, I actually have been on an open rescue uh, with direct action everywhere, a little bit un unlike the one that you saw today, because the one today or the one the one we just saw took place in the middle of the day and, uh, you know, cameras were rolling and such. I went inside at night and there was, you know, no arrest or anything like that. I was arrested during a, a uh, coincidentally, during a pro uh, while we were protesting chicken caporos, which is a ritual whereby practitioners swing chickens around their heads, and uh, Nathan Semmel was there and, and uh, witnessed the arrest, and I was taken to uh, the local precinct, and I should have been sort of booked right there and given a summons with a court date, but instead I was taken down to the tombs and kept for about 11 hours in the tombs uh, before uh, my arraignment. Um, so I was in custody for probably a good 12 or, or more hours before my arraignment. And what does that feel like? Um, you know, quite frankly, I, I, I felt, um, I felt badly for the other people who were in, uh, in jail with me. 
because I knew that I had legal representation on the outside. I knew that there were people on the outside were help, who were helping me. And I had the impression that a lot of people who were inside who might also not have committed a crime, I, I had not committed a crime. I was falsely charged of assaulting a, a New York City official, someone who I didn't even touch. And, um, and I thought, wow, a lot of these people are going to uh, are not going to have the kind of privilege that I have to be represented by a lawyer. So that's quite funky. That's how I felt at the time. I, I felt badly for everybody else. Let's take a look again at the actual crime in progress. And it's interesting because um, somebody said, if you look at it right here, one of the comments that just came in is, couldn't they have done it more secretly or asked to buy the chickens that are sick? Just asking. Ellen Dent, as an activist, what is your response to that suggestion? Why doesn't it make sense to you lightly? Uh, they wanted people to see them take these chickens, these individuals off the truck. And, uh, you know, and I believe in their minds, they were not committing a crime. They were doing uh, what is right. Uh, which is saving another being's life who is in danger and, and suffering. So, I mean, there's such a thing as unjust laws. And any law that says that you own another individual is an unjust law. So, uh, you know, there are people that are going to have to pioneer and uh, face the consequences, which includes risking their own freedom to free others that have been enslaved and are you know, heading towards their ultimate demise at a slaughterhouse. So, uh, you know, I, I find this to be incredibly necessary. Uh, I think that uh, Alicia and Alexandra are so brave for doing what they did. Uh, you know, I, I truly admire them. And as someone that, you know, helped organize pig vigils for several years, uh, there's no way that I wouldn't have tried to get one of those individuals off the truck in any way that I could have. Let's go straight out to Carla Cabral, our reporter on the scene at court. Bring us up today, Carla. What happened in court today? It's definitely been a long day. We've been out here since uh, 8.30 this morning. We began with a small demonstration. Well, I say small, but there are actually about 60 activists who are here today. Uh, they are inside the courtroom right now, lining the hallway. We waited in the morning and then we were able to go into the courtroom for just maybe five minutes. Uh, most of the morning was other uh, cases going on. And then we went in and there was a person who um, was not the judge, but they let us know that the case would get started at 1.30 in another courtroom. So we waited all day uh, and then went to that courtroom where we waited some more. The defendants all went in and I believe that they were hearing motions, but we did not go in at that time. And then the jury showed up. So the jury came and lined the hallway. Uh, there were a lot of jurors such that they filled the entire courtroom and were even standing. So none of us could go in. And they, uh, a bunch of jurors came out just recently. I'm sure that were uh, excused and they are still in the process of Wadir right now. Now, I want to show the scene outside the courthouse. I don't think this court in Livingston has ever seen anything like this. Uh, red flares, pink flares, um, just absolutely wild. Uh, just what was it like there, Carla, to be outside the court with this wild demonstration going on? Everybody's really excited. I mean, we believe in the right to rescue and we are here in complete support for Alexandra and Alicia uh, and Jax, uh, is now a year and a half old. And so we are all here in celebration of his life. So everybody is extremely excited to be able to represent uh, Jax and, and to uphold the right to rescue. I want to go to one of my dear friends who is a philanthropist who has supported Direct Action Everywhere, which is the organization that did an undercover video in advance of the open rescue um, showing what they said was extremely cruel conditions inside the slaughterhouse. We'll get to that in a second, but uh, Mick Davoudian, why do you support a DXE? Why do you think it's very important and they're one of the most um, successful animal rights groups in America right now? 
Well, uh, Wayne Shong, uh, the founder of DXC, I think this is kind of a, a dream of his. It has been a dream of his for many years. He's actually, DXC um, is paving the path to the future. And I think what's happening is a lot of people right now are slowly realizing that activists like Alexandra, like um, Alicia, and the like, um, they are actually leading the way. Um, and for example, the prosecutor is re getting ready to prosecute these two amazing activists starting tomorrow. He should realize at some point in his life, hopefully, before he's dead, or she, I should say, I don't know who the prosecutor is, that these activists that they are trying to prosecute right now are really saving the future for their own kids. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the case itself, and we're going to dive into that right now. Um, let's hear from um, Wayne, who was in court this morning. He is just recently acquitted for rescuing um piglets from the Smithfield factory farm in Utah. He represented himself. He happens to be a constitutional law professor. And now he is representing Alexandra Paul in this court case. Um, let's hear from Wayne this morning. How do you guys feel about everything so far? Have we been, have we been, uh, so there's civil? nothing significant that's happened. We just, the, the main thing that happens, we figured out who our judge is. And Judge Paul Lowe is a good judge. He gave a ruling on the subpoena of Foster Farms that I thought was, you know, we didn't get everything we asked for, and I think everything we were entitled for, but he was at least listening to the arguments carefully. And he had read through the briefing. So, and, you know, sometimes you get judges that don't read through all the briefing and think carefully about the arguments. This judge has done that. So, I'm feeling good about that. But, the odds are this trial is going to be delayed considerably because a judge came down with COVID. We're swapping to a different judge. It's a good judge. We're happy with it. But, you know, this means we're probably going to week two. I'm guessing this trial goes into Monday and Tuesday of next week. So we'll see. Wow. So, Carla, you're there. You've also been in court. What was accomplished? We're just in the first phases of jury selection. And frankly, I've really never even heard of a misdemeanor theft case having a jury. That sounds crazy, Carla. Uh, we're gonna well, obviously, yeah, we're excited to have a jury. Uh, you know, we would like the opportunity to show what happens on these factory farms and what fate awaited Jax and Ethan if they were not rescued from that truck. We want the public to be able to see this and to be the ones to make the decision. So we're very excited about that. And um, how far along are they in jury selection? Uh, I mean, I can't say other than a lot of people came out the door before we joined in here. So I don't know how long it's going to take. It was predicted that the jury would be selected today. So I'm not sure if they're going to stay late in order to make that happen. Uh, but hopefully the jury selection will be finished today and we will be starting with uh, the trial tomorrow. Although there might be some more motions to be heard. There were a lot of motions uh, to be decided even before the jury selection. One of which was, if you can see, I'm wearing a, a red armband. We were instructed not to wear our, our blue DXC shirts or any animal rights, anything that would identify us. Um, but we chose to wear these red armbands and uh, the prosecution wanted us to not be allowed to do so. And the judge ruled in our favor. And um, of course, look at the scene outside the courthouse. Um, this is absolutely extraordinary. I doubt that this small town, Livingston in Merced County, um, which is kind of in the San Jose, you know, a uh, northern part of California has ever seen anything like it. Um, briefly, what were the motions? In other words, uh, one of the key issues in other cases have been were you allowed to show the video of the crime in progress? I know that in some cases they wouldn't even let you show the video because it was too upsetting. But this is really just grabbing a couple of animals who are very sick from a truck. Can the jury see that? I don't have the answer to that question right now. That was one of the motions to suppress any video, to suppress uh, photos. Uh, I mean, I read through the the 
paperwork that was submitted and it was pretty much they wanted to suppress almost everything saying that it was hearsay and uh it, it had no relevance to to the trial um so i don't know yet what the uh the result is i'm hoping that if we're still on live i'll be able to catch wayne and the others as they exit and maybe we'll get an update at that time so and thank you carla wow amazing reporting out there uh, Nathan Semmel, you're a former Manhattan district attorney, uh, assistant district attorney. You're an attorney in New York. They say the case is won or lost on jury selection. Um, so uh, what can uh, the defense do to make sure that they have a compassionate jury? And also, why on earth would the prosecution not want to show videotape of this crime? Because it shows the alleged crime in progress, which the defense says was a rescue of sick animals. Jane, I'm going to answer your second question first, if that's OK. Um, I, think the pro I think the prosecutor is going to offer the video of the rescue, um, what they call a theft, uh, in their case. What I think they want to exclude is the undercover footage from inside um, Foster Farms. That's what they are going to great lengths to keep the jury from seeing. Um, but it's my understanding that they are going to offer the video. And I don't think, and I don't think the defense would object to it. I think that, that unlike the prosecution, the defense wants the jury to get a complete understanding of, of, of the case. Um, as far as, as, far as uh, jury selection, it's crucial. I mean, you want, if you're a defense attorney, you want people who are receptive to your defenses, to the concept of reasonable doubt, um, people who will keep an open mind, um, and people who are compassionate. You know, this is a case that's not, this isn't the theft of, um, you know, of a television. This is a, this is a, a theft, a rescue of a life. And um, I think you want people to be able to open their minds to the possibility of concepts such as necessity, um, which I think will play a very big factor in this case. Yes. And I want to say, Dotsy Bausch, you are not just an Olympian and one of my heroes, but you do a podcast with um, Alexandra Paul. I'm going to play a clip of the podcast where she talks a little bit about her values and why she has taken this extraordinary step of getting arrested and rejecting plea deals so that she can go to trial on um, what makes Alexandra Paul an actress slash activist tick. So you've always told me that your uh, mother uh, taught you guys, so you have a twin sister and you also have a younger brother, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that she always taught you guys to be you know, active, to, to stand up for your beliefs. Yeah, she voted every election and she donated blood regularly. She always right. um, volunteered and we recycled. Yeah, so uh, Dotsy, there's a big difference between recycling and getting arrested. <laughs> yeah, well, slightly, right? I think one of the most important points that, that maybe we haven't made that Alexandra made to me uh, very vehemently on the phone a couple days ago is that this case is not about death because she said that is going to be a very poor argument but this case is about torture this slaughter this foster found slaughterhouse in particular kills 140 chickens every 60 seconds and as you can only imagine what they must go through uh for that speed to happen many of them are boiled alive a lot of mistakes are made so this this case is all about the torture of these living beings, not about death. So, you know, she wanted to really make that point uh, to me and to, to share to share with all of you. Absolutely. And what we can talk about now and show you is this case has made the New York Times. And here is um, the article. It's an opinion piece, but it states it flat out. Rescuing farmed animals from cruelty should be legal. Talks about this case. And here's exactly what um, Dotsie Bausch was just talking about. Frankly, I could show you the video, but it's so upsetting. It's so disturbing. Uh, honestly, uh, I was afraid that everybody would just run away. And then also we get flagged as having content that is uh, too upsetting and nobody gets to see our coverage. But here's what the New York Times article said. 
DXE brought in uh, infrared cameras that can see in the dark. The DXE activists captured video showing a production line moving too quickly. About 140 chickens killed every minute of each of the four on each of the four slaughtering lines in Livingston, which is where this all happened, to offer any kind of humane death for the animals. Live birds are seen thrown, crushed, left for dead, and suffocated under piles of dead birds. Some aren't properly stunned before they're killed. And while the DXC footage doesn't show this, USDA inspectors have reported seeing evidence that birds at the Livingston facility have been dunked alive in boiling water. Now, uh, I have to say this was what Foster Farms told the New York Times in response. Foster Farms denies any wrongdoing in a statement. A spokesperson told me, meaning the author, that allegations of inhumane treatment are without merit and a disservice to the thousands of Foster Farms team members that are dedicated to providing millions of families in the Western United States and beyond with a quality, nutritious product. And we invite Foster Farms on any time here on Unchained TV. Mick Davoudian, um, that is the backstory. Their DXC and Alexander are saying, and Alicia, we tried to to show authorities that what they see on this video, they believe is criminal behavior, and the authorities did nothing. That's true, and uh, I think that's part of the reason. Maybe Nathan can speak on this on this topic later. I think uh, they were fighting very hard during the hearings and to allow information about the particular flock of birds that were uh, with the group of birds that were on this particular truck with regards to the disease and mortality rates and so on. I think that might be quite critical in this case because unlike the Smithfield case, for example, where you saw the video, I believe it was in, um, allowed to be shown to the jury, but we all saw the video where they go in and there's all sorts of animals and they saw these very sick piglets and they pick them out. In this case, the video looks like they grabbed the two birds easily reachable at the very front. So I think it would be critical to show that these birds were taken, but it's just not random that all these animals are very sick. And uh, Elmer St. John says, please call the district attorney, Nicole Silviera of Merced County. And she actually gives a number and the email and said, basically, let them know that they're prosecuting the wrong people. OK, that Foster Farms should have been prosecuted. Uh, again, we invite Foster Farms on any time. And I have to say that in preparation for this live interview, I emailed that district attorney and asked her to comment on the allegation that they're prosecuting the wrong people. And I did not get a response, but she also is invited on any time. We would love to dialogue with Foster Farms. We would love to dialogue with the district attorney. By the way, of the two chickens that were rescued, which prosecutors are saying were stolen, this one, Jax, is living in an unnamed sanctuary and survived. The other one died. So, uh, Nathan, the argument is that these were sick animals and they actually got, uh, they won like a ruling that said, you know, Foster Farms has to give information about the condition of this batch of animals. Uh, explain that. I think the relevance to the defense having information regarding that batch goes to the concept of value. Um, and we saw this also in the Smithfield Farms case. In order to steal something, it has to have value, the, the, the property has to have value. And if that flock of birds, um, if there is documentary or other evidence that shows that these were sick birds, then it calls into question whether they actually not only had any monetary value, but actually whether they have been a liability. Um, we saw that in Smithfield. So um, I, I have a feeling that's what that uh, that pertains to what Mick was referring to. So I want to ask Ellen Dent. Um, Ellen, you know, you've covered so many uh, protests and vigils outside uh, pig slaughterhouses, outside other places where animals are being slaughtered. We have a bird flu that is decimating birds, millions of birds around this country. Um, would you say that the powers that be, the authorities, are really focusing on the wrong thing right now when we're in the midst of a potential crisis 
with um, avian flu wiping out millions of birds who um, have done nothing to deserve dying a horrible fate with uh, controversy about the impact of animal agriculture on climate change, on habitat destruction, wildlife extinction, human world hunger because they're an inefficient food source. And yet what the authorities in a blue state in supposedly liberal California are doing is going after um, people who pulled two sick chickens off of a truck. Yeah, it's it's absolutely ridiculous uh, that, you know, that they're having this case at all. And I think they know that. And that's why they've tried to give uh, them so many deals to get out of, uh, you know, having to have this go to trial. And, uh, you know, I also want to like say that it's just so insulting that they are seen as products. They're not products. They are individuals, they are living, sentient beings, and it's absolutely incorrect to call them products or to commodify their bodies in any way. Uh, we need to steer away from animal agriculture. Uh, we need to change policy uh, towards plant-based. Uh, you know, plants uh, aren't going to get avian flu or swine flu or any other flu or, or zoonotic disease that can be transmitted to humans as well. I mean, look at what we just went through the last few years and it's still going on. Uh, people need to wake up. Like we need to stop eating animals immediately. Our futures are at stake. Uh, the future of my child, uh, Aria, she's only three years old. Uh, I want her to live in a better world. I want her to live in a world uh, where other animals have rights just like we do. Well said, and I know your daughter is plant-based and she looks uh, pretty darn healthy to me. Uh, it's yes. always good to see. Aria there. Um, I'm going to go back to Carla Cabral on the scene. You know, part of this, and let me first just play a little snippet from court. This is the only snippet we've gotten so far. But as opposed to the dramatic demonstrations outside court, what's happening in court is slow and it could almost be described as boring. Uh, I'm really just uh, keeping the seat warm today. I'm going to. Um, Move your matter to courtroom three at 1.30 uh, for, for trial. So uh, courtroom three, unfortunately courtroom three was, uh, uh, had a heavy calendar this morning, otherwise I would send you over this morning and we got a late start, but uh, uh, so 1.30 courtroom three. And you'll be in front of yes. Judge Lowe? Uh, Judge Lowe is here today, so. Understood, Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So they move over to courtroom three, and now it's happening, jury selection. But this has been kind of a crazy case because somebody got COVID, apparently. And um, I mean, this is possibly going to go, as Wayne said, into next week over a misdemeanor theft case. Uh, it, it's, it's hard for me to imagine, given that um, we know that there are a lot of cases that are not even being prosecuted if they're below a certain level. I mean, you you hear this all the time. If something is stolen and it's less than a thousand dollars, you know, uh, police don't take it that seriously. Uh, what do you make of that? What are the comments at court, Carla? Well, yeah, that so that was just a few minutes that we were allowed inside, and uh, like I said, the. Uh, it, that was a commissioner that that sent us to to courtroom three. I did get an update just now from Curtis, uh, who was inside the courtroom, and he said that uh, 31 of the jurors were already let go uh, due to whatever circumstances did not let them sit on the jury. And then there are so many more that they still need to go through that uh, some are inside being questioned, and they let a whole bunch of other jurors go. That's why I saw so many come out. So absolutely, even just the jury selection is going to go well into tomorrow as well before the trial starts. And I think the difference here uh, is because the defendants did not simply take a plea deal. So I think with a lot of those other, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of those other petty thefts, people will take a plea deal and just let it go. But because Alicia and Alexandra are strong and want this to be played out, that is what is, is taking so long and making this a big deal. Uh, well said. Donnie Moss, let's look at the big picture. You have 
a Wayne Shung who was recently acquitted in Utah. And I can even play a little clip of his closing statement, which was so emotional, which we also covered here at Unchained TV. Um, and the jury really was, it was supposed to be a slam dunk from the prosecution. The DXE videotaped themselves going into the Smithfield slaughterhouse in a video called Operation Death Star, not with one camera, but with a whole series of high-tech cameras showing the horror of it. The prosecution didn't want to let them even show the jury the incredible horror inside that ginormous factory farm where pigs are kept in crates the size of their bodies. And um, he appealed to the jury and they acquitted him and his co-defendant, Paul Picklesheimer, on all charges. It was a huge victory. This is part of a whole campaign by DXC to actually almost say, arrest me because I want to move case law and help it evolve to the point where animals are not just regarded as Oh, equivalent to a tin can. Let's hear Wayne's closing argument in his previous case where he was acquitted in Utah, and then we'll talk about it. And I wish I could tell you the full story of what happened. We were on very direct orders to talk only about the night of March 7th, 2017, only about two pickets. Um, but it's an interesting thing hearing someone as compelling as Vaughn, and he's a very compelling speaker, talk about what's in your heart in a way that you know is not true, and it's not. Um, and honestly, the best way to explain it is the way Rick explained it, that there's a big difference between stealing an animal and trying to help someone who needs some help. And I think at the end of this closing argument, we can convince, hopefully, that that's all we're trying to do. But I did want to go back to where we started. In our opening statement, or I should say my opening statement, not our opening statement, uh, that we talked about how there were no piglets taken from gestation anymore. And we don't have to worry about Count one is count. We're not talking about gestation buildings. The prosecution is conceded, and the judge has ruled that we don't have to do that charge. But these two pieces are still very important. And the first piece is that we didn't have any purpose to take anything of value from Sydney. We were there to document conditions and save lives. So incredible. Poof, I get emotional watching that. Such a brilliant uh, closing statement acquitted on all counts in a very conservative agriculture state, Utah. Um, this is part of a campaign, Donnie. Spell it out for us. Well, first, I'll, first I'll say that the, uh, the I think that the prosecution and the judge in that case were foolish uh, by not allowing the crime to be uh, shown. The defense wanted the, their crime to be shown. And I think the jury saw that the that the prosecution didn't want the crime to be shown and, and were suspicious. And I think that that uh, probably the judge and the prosecution made a big mistake. But what the activists are doing here, which is so brilliant, um, is that they're provoking these prosecutions in order to shine a really a global spotlight on what goes on inside of factory farms and slaughterhouses. And they're doing so at a great risk to their own safety and their own freedom. But these freedom fighters know that this is what needs to be done in order to affect global change. And I think anybody who sees footage inside of a factory farm or a slaughterhouse would say, this is wrong. But ag gag laws and even social media that blocks this footage, it just it become and, and the mainstream media, which doesn't want to show this footage, it becomes difficult for people to actually see it. And so that's why cases like this are so important because they really shine a spotlight. Um, and, you know, I think I'm really surprised I have to say that Foster Farms didn't instruct the DA to drop these charges because Foster Farms is just shining a spotlight on itself. And anybody can get online and Google Foster Farms and they will see, if they look a little bit on YouTube, they will see footage of what goes on inside of Foster Farms um, factory, the warehouses. And it's pretty egregious stuff. So I, I'm I'm confused as to why Foster Farms is is letting the DA prosecute this case. Uh, Jane, I just want to add one more thing. You know, for people who haven't seen footage inside of a factory farm, and, and this discussion about uh, the uh, records about the health of this particular flock, something doesn't really make sense here. I mean, if you've seen what goes on, you know, chickens are in these massive warehouses. There are thousands upon thousands of them crowded together, 
And when they're taken out of the factory farm and, and loaded into trucks and then transported to a slaughterhouse, it's done at, it's done at random. You could see that in the footage. You've got workers grabbing dozens of chickens and tossing them into trucks or into crates that go into trucks. So and these they're no they don't have veterinarians there. These these animals aren't get, getting veterinary care. So what health records are we even talking about? I mean, I'm glad that they're asking for them and maybe they're shining on the spotlight on the fact that there aren't health records for all these chickens. Uh, I think these are very good points. And it was a point that Alexandra Paul herself made uh, at the start of this case. And I'd like to play that because she, again, not only said, no, I won't take a plea deal, not only said, yeah, videotape me rescuing these chickens, but she lays out why she did it. Chaos at the high slaughter speeds that workers are pressured to meet. Living birds sometimes get mistaken for dead ones and are thrown in the trash alive. I knew that this cruel fate was waiting for birds on that slaughter truck. I knew the conditions that they were raised in by foster farms left many of them injured, infected, and disabled. DXE had tried reporting these criminal conditions to the authorities, but we were ignored. Uh, so, Dotsie Bausch, you are a close friend of Alexandra Paul. You have a podcast together. Um, is she on this kind of crusade that is part of a broader DXC, Direct Action Everywhere, campaign to actually proactively get arrested to try to put these images in front of the general public that the advertiser-based media doesn't show because look who keeps the lights on meat dairy and pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. yeah i mean she said to me uh very plain and simple i am a proxy for these chickens because they don't have any rights and they need to have rights and i said are you scared about the possibility of serving six months i mean that's a long time and she's like six months i'll get three squares a day in a bed that doesn't have my own feces in it so no, that that's that's nothing compared to what the chickens go through. So she um, is a, is standing up uh, as as a proxy. That is what she sees as her job today and, and Mick, the rest of the week. Mick Davudian, I mean, you specifically support DXE, and by the way, Unchained TV as well. Thank you very much um, because you see that they have the vision, and I would say that. You know, I'm a big supporter of PETA. I, anytime I get an email, I do exactly what PETA says because they have action points. I can call and email my U.S. senators. I can boom, boom, boom. They're genius. But I would say right up there is Direct Action Everywhere, a much smaller organization that is getting in the New York Times consistently. But why do you have to get arrested and risk your life in order to get into the New York Times is my question, Mick. Well, I think history has shown that unless people get arrested, not much happens. I mean, it happens with the civil rights, it happens with the gay rights. Um, I remember marching for gay rights back in the 80s, and that was the only way you could get attention. And a lot of times it led to arrests. I personally have never been arrested. I've vowed not to be arrested because I thought a better way, there are better ways for me to serve. I wanted to be able to work and make money and be able to support the organizations. And DXC, speaking of organizations, as a grassroots organization is tops on my list of organizations that are really making an impact towards animal rights and towards opening the eyes of the public as to what's really happening. Because unless people realize what's happening behind the closed doors, they will not take action. And if people don't take action, they're basically supporting all these atrocities by everyday habits of eating. And I will say something else, it also helps that Alexandra Paul is a celebrity. She was on Baywatch with Pamela Anderson. And guess what? Pamela Anderson herself is also an animal rights activist. In fact, I attended an event with her quite a few years ago, maybe six years ago or so, where she spoke before the Los Angeles Unified School District trying to get the LAUSD to provide more plant-based options and vegan milk. Let's listen. Animal agriculture is responsible for 80% of U.S. water usage. In addition, the United Nations says that raising animals for food is one of the top contributors to the most serious environmental problems. Giving 600,000 students the ability to make eco-friendly decisions 
every single day, gives them the tools and the power to help reverse climate change, conserve water, prevent pollution, and fight obesity. As a mother, I understand the challenge of trying to raise healthy kids when they are bombarded with appealing ads for junk foods. Putting great tasting, nutritious foods in children and teenagers' hands can set them up for a lifetime of positive choices. So I want to go back to Carla Cabral on the scene. Alexandra Paul, while very modest and doesn't brag about it, she's been in more than 100 movies. She is a movie star, a TV star. Baywatch is an iconic series. How is that impacting the case? You're far from Hollywood in Northern California in a very small town. It reminds me of the song, Do You Know the Way to San Jose? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know that... Um that her celebrity is having a huge impact on, say, the jury. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know how many of them know Alexandra. I mean, as you said, she's been in over 100 movies, uh, very popular. Uh, I will say that her celebrity is making a splash in that she had asked for several other uh celebrities to be character witnesses and that was one motion that the prosecution was also trying to make sure that that did not happen because i think that they know that if even more celebrities show up uh to vouch for alexandra it's going to be even harder to uh to try this case oh absolutely and i think one of the celebrities who they wanted to get as a character witness is none other than our own Doxy Bausch, who is here with us today. Um, what happened with that? Are you going to go to court and testify, you think? No, well, no, they, they decided, I, I'm, I'm not in the country, but I told Alexandra I'd fly in a flash. She said, no, you're not, you're not coming in for like a three minute conversation. They tried to do it virtually, but then the judge denied that we could do it virtually. So I will get on the plane the second she says she needs me to, but she's like, you're not doing it. You're not doing it. So I, I don't know, but I, I want to be there. Quite frankly, I wish she would, she would call and say, come. Wow. Well, you know, I covered the Michael Jackson trial not so far from where you are, Carla, in Santa Maria, California. And um, that was a runaway freight train where celebrities were showing up uh, left and right. The entire Jackson clan showed up in a giant bus in matching outfits. I mean, it was a wild case. And uh, Tom Ezra, who successfully defended Michael Jackson, had a, a witness list that had like Elizabeth Tate, you know, major celebrities. None of them were, a lot of them were not actually called, but it, it created a, a, a huge, like, um, panic uproar, uh, practically a stampede every time a new celebrity was announced and uh, the media would scramble. Um, I was actually called to testify in that case, and uh, I was subpoenaed, but I never actually was called to testify. I was subpoenaed. And even getting handed a subpoena is is really kind of a shocking and jarring experience. So, you know, it's easy to say in theory, oh, I'm going to go get arrested to help animals. It's quite another thing to actually do that. And I got to go back to Donnie Moss because you're you've done many, many things where you have been falsely accused of assault. You've been, you've done die-ins. I mean, uh, you, you've done a lot of very effective, but very, um, I would say, um, you know, uh, not controversial, but I would say impactful, risky cam campaigns. What, what is it like for people, you know, we're armchair quarterbacking here saying, oh yeah, she's, she's risking going to jail for six months. I did a series where I was in jail for like six hours and it, it had an impact on me. I, I was I was absolutely devastated. Yeah, well, so part of what I do is pressure campaigns. And I have to say they're not they're not fun. They're unpleasant. You know, when we're targeting often individuals or corporations that are doing the wrong thing and you start polite with the letters and the petitions, and then you escalate. And then you show up at their office and do a protest in the lobby. And when that doesn't go anywhere, then you find out where the board members live and the senior executives. Then you show up on their front lawn and then you start to see action. But as soon as you ask, you know, the more you escalate, the more repression you experience as an activist. And so the time that I was arrested, we, you know, it's an interesting story. We were, we were protesting 
at a spin studio that was owned by a city health official, a city health official who was ignoring us when we were protesting at the health department. And so we escalated. We went to a, a, a spin studio that he co-owned with his partner, and we protested in the lobby of that spin studio. And that's when he used his power as a high-level city executive to get the NYPD to come and arrest me uh, for an assault that I never committed. And so, you know, these things, the, the more you push, the more you step out of the, your comfort zone, the more risk you take. And um, but but, you know, as others have said here on the panel, that's the price for liberation, whether it's for the gay rights movement or the women's rights movement or the civil rights movement. And now the animal rights movement, we all have to step out of our comfort zones and we all have to take risks that we'd rather not take in order to move the needle in the right direction. I mean, direct action everywhere, Jane, earlier you were talking about what's the end game here. They're trying to dismantle an entire system that pervades the whole planet, which is factory farming. It's a tall order. And in order to get there, more of us are going to have to participate in these open rescues. More of us are going to ha have to take these kinds of risks. I also want to just say one more thing, Jane, about the factory farms, because I know you're not showing the footage inside for you know the reasons you stated that the video will be censored. But so much of what you see in the videos, you know, it, it as awful as it is, it's even worse in in real life because you, the videos don't show you the smells, and the 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 fumes and the and and the what you're breathing in. It's so much worse than what you would imagine based on seeing the footage. And I, I just wanted to put that out there. It's uh, so for the people like DXC activists who go into these places and, and get this footage and conduct these rescues, they're heroes in ways we, we haven't even considered. Absolutely. And uh, we have a whole series, if you want to revisit the trial on Unchained TV, the global streaming network for animal rights, animals, people, and the planet. We also show um, so many of the vigils that Ellen Dent and others have organized over the years at uh, the uh, farmer John Smithfield Slaughterhouse, which has since shut down. And we're about to launch a uh, series on the closure of Farmer John. Um, Ellen Dent, you know, you were right there in the trenches holding these vigils. Uh, certainly it had an impact. And now they have left Los Angeles. The world's largest pig slaughter company has packed up and moved out of Los Angeles after years of you doing along with an incredible team, Amy Jean Davis and others, um, vigils and activism outside that slaughterhouse. Yes. Yes, uh, they did recently uh, stop uh, delivering pigs to that location, and they are going to be shutting down that plant within the year, or slaughterhouse, as we should call it, because that's what it is. And, uh, you know, what we did is we were there. We were there uh, with Animal Save Movement, and uh, we bore witness to the suffering of these individuals, and we showed others what was happening to them. And, uh, you know, we weren't the only groups out there. There were several um, other activists uh, before us that went out there and, uh, you know, during that time that we were out there. And, uh, you know, I'm just so grateful to everyone that did come, that did attend a vigil, that did show what happens to these individuals, uh, you know, before they are brought into the slaughterhouse. And, uh, you know, I just want to second what Donnie Moss said. Uh, I've also been to chicken vigils as well uh, with LA Animal Save. And, I, I mean, I can't even explain the, the smell of the ammonia on a truck uh, like you see in the video with Alexander Paul and Alicia Centurio, Centurio uh, when they're rescuing these chickens. I mean, the, the smell, I literally, like my face would burn. It was just so strong. Like you could tell that these chickens were raised in their own filth uh, for, you know, all of the 35 days uh, that they're given to live on average before they do go to the slaughterhouse. It's just absolutely horrific and it, it's wrong. It's wrong. And I don't think there's really any other way to put it um, than doing this to another being, uh, to another animal is wrong and we wouldn't want this done to us. So why do we continue doing this? Uh, exactly. And uh, people on the front lines of history, I mean, these New York Times articles, they're opinion pieces, but they all say things you know, similar to one day we'll look back in horror. But yet, if you don't cover this, 
Okay, as a journalist, you are abrogating your journalistic responsibility. And yes, it's nice to have these opinion pieces. You know, DXC has gone to extraordinary lengths. And really the payoff is, and I'll show you, the payoff is literally a couple of articles. And that, why isn't this on the front page? Why isn't this on the front page? I'll just show you the articles really quickly. Okay, this, a woman risked her life, went into the Farmer John Slaughterhouse, went into the carbon dioxide stunning chamber and videotaped the horrors that occurred in there. Okay, she almost died, okay, because they are asphyxiated, but it is a horrible, gruesome death. She got into the New York Times, okay? And now you have Alexandra Paul, and getting arrested and you get into the New York Times. But honestly, the New York Times should not ask people or, or wait for people to risk their lives in order to cover this. Um, I want to go back out to Carla Cabral. What is the media presence there? Because I know a lot of times there isn't the kind of media presence that you'd want at these trials. And you're lucky to get that post-trial article in the New York Times, but it should be, you know, all the stations, all the big outlets there, are they? Absolutely not. Um, I agree. We, we'd hoped that there would be more press. Uh, I know that Marina, uh, if you know Marina, also wanted to be here and was ignored. Uh, we did have one cameraman from I believe a local news station that came out this morning and interviewed uh, Cassie King and also interviewed uh, Alexandra Paul. So hopefully we'll have some coverage. I don't know if coverage will increase over the days, but right now it's nothing. And I mean, you can't say there isn't good video. It's exciting video, okay? Because I was a, a TV news reporter and TV host for almost 40 years. And, uh, you know, if you have exciting video, that helps make a story. Well, you're looking at the video of the alleged crime slash open rescue of these chickens, one of whom died and the other who was living at a sanctuary. You've got all the elements for a good case. You've got uh, a movie star, an actress who was on Baywatch with Pamela Anderson, you've got exciting video, you've got undercover footage. See, um, one of the reasons I started Unchained TV, our global streaming network, which I, I would urge everybody who's watching, please download it. You can download it for free on your phone. It takes five seconds. You go to your app store and you just put it in. It's absolutely 100% free. It's all nonprofit. It has hundreds of videos. This is this is streaming live right now on the app. You can also watch it on your Amazon Fire via Amazon Fire Stick on your TV, Apple TV, Roku device. It's going to be on all Samsung TVs within a month. The reason I did this is that I was in the news media and I saw how they would not cover these stories. And I said, one day I will get this information out. So you can help us by downloading the app, Unchained TV, one word, and it's 100% free. Best if you give your email, but it's not even required. We are making it as easy as possible for people to uh, download this because there is a mainstream media blackout. I mean, everybody should be covering this because it's a highly visual trial. You've got um, a defendant who is a TV star. You've got... Um, you know, a dramatic display outside court and still they do not cover it. So just to answer anybody's questions as to why I started Unchained TV, a global streaming network, that's why. We have to stop begging for permission. We have to take back the power. And if we um, support organizations like Unchained TV by downloading the app and by sharing out the videos, which there's a function where you can share out the videos to your Facebook or Twitter, then we can get it out there because insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Yeah, we would love all these media people to be there. Um, it's not even really articles. It's still opinion pieces at the end of the day that the New York Times 
is is running and it's better than nothing. But my gosh, Mick Davoudian, um, you know, talk to us a little bit about uh, your perspective on this media blackout. Well, I mean, I've learned a lot talking to you about this, and uh, you are correct in mentioning the fact that these businesses, they're bought and paid for it by big industry. And big ag is, let's not forget, it's an incredibly huge part of uh, the, uh, you know, the economy. It runs everything. Uh, at the same time, it's destroying our health. It's destroying the environment, the groundwater contamination, uh, you know, on and on. We've all heard about him at nauseum. Uh, we're talking about uh, one of, the judge got COVID. Hopefully the judge will be uh, feeling well soon. But I mean, people need to put two and two together. Uh, all these um, diseases, they are not happening in a vacuum. It's all related to these vile industries. It's very similar to the tobacco industry, you know, of years past. And uh, back then, I mean, the, the doctors were bought and paid for. The doctors would basically smoke. If you look at old videos of doctors on TV, they would be smoking while giving medical advice. So, I mean, it's really entrenched in our entire society. So to break free of that, it's very difficult. And this is why I think, as you have very correctly pointed out many times, uh, media is not willing to participate because their ad dollars are coming from the industry. So why would they criticize the industry that's bringing their bread and butter, or I should say bread and plant-based butter? <laughs> bread and Miyoko's butter. Right. Um, yeah. Sometimes people say, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. I said, no, I was in the news business for 40 years. You don't have to have somebody come up on your desk and knock and say, don't cover the story. If you have half a brain, you look at the commercials, you do the math yourself. OK, so um, we are going to restart our coverage now because we are at the top of the hour. And I have to say. What is happening at court, we're going to get the latest from Carla. Carla, bring us the very latest. Well, as I sit outside the courthouse right now, uh, there are around 60 activists who are inside still waiting uh, while jury selection is going on. This morning, we heard from a commissioner uh, that at 1.30, we could go to another court uh, courtroom and, and start uh, hearing motions. So at 1.30, they started hearing motions uh, and then uh, they brought in the jury and they are still in there right now. It's my understanding that very soon that should be ending for today and that will pick up tomorrow. So very shortly, hopefully within, I would say the next 10 or so minutes, I would expect to start seeing people come out and then we're going to be heading somewhere to have a protest. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, first of all, Carla Cabral, a great, incredible reporter, 100% volunteer, doing this incredible work from just the goodness of her heart. And I got to say, it's not easy to be out there. We're going to hopefully get that update in uh, just a couple of minutes time and find out because remember, they say the case is won or lost in jury selection. Uh, let's hit the restart button and bring us up to date on what this case is all about. Hi, Unchained. It's Alexandra. Thank you so much for being here and covering the trial. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for covering this and thank you everybody at home who's watching and supporting the right now. So let's start with Nathan Semmel, a former Manhattan assistant district attorney who's been in the courtroom many, many, many times. Why is jury selection so important and how can Wayne Shung, who is a constitutional law professor, co-founder of Direct Action Everywhere, uh, figure out who's going to be compassionate and who's not going to care and just say, well, you know, you broke the law. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, you know, you try to play analyst to some extent. You have a conversation with people who you've never met before and you try to figure out, are these people who are going to, you know, ultimately decide 
in my client's favor. Um, there's some guesswork. Some people, it's pretty obvious. This is a person who I don't want on my, uh, you know, on my jury. How? How? Um, how? Well, I think they, you know, they they tend to be a little bit um, more rigid and not be able to accept possible defenses. Um, I think you also want to try to, you know, one of the things that I often ask jury jurors when I'm when I'm representing somebody at trial is I ask them right out right out, right off the bat. When you first sat down today and you looked over and you saw my client sitting at the table, did you ask yourself, I wonder what he did or she did? And that question in and of itself is, you know, that's human nature. Somebody is going to look over and see somebody sitting in a courtroom charged with a crime. What did they do? But the truth of the matter is they're innocent until they've proven guilty. And you want people who, you know, sort of adopt that position and seem to be able to keep an open mind. Um, and you, add, you know, you ask them questions, you try to lay out your case the best you can during jury selection and you, cause it's the only opportunity you get to actually have a conversation. You know, I get to give an opening statement. I get to give a summation. The witnesses speak, they're, they're examined, but I don't get to speak to the jury during the trial. So this is the one and only opportunity you have to do it. So you want to get their minds start to you know, see the case the way you wanted them to see it. So in a case like this, the words like rescue, necessity, life, and get them using those kind of words. But if instead they tend to sort of move to words like steal, um, food, you know, the thing, business, profit, things like that, those are jurors we probably wouldn't want on, on a case like this. So, you know, again, it's there's, it's, there's no recipe to it but it, but you know with experience it, it is it's very very important if and i don't want this to happen obviously but if alexandra paul is convicted could that backfire on the industry even more doxy bausch you are a dear friend and you have a podcast with alexandra paul my question to you is if for some reason she is convicted and she is in jail, could that turn her into a martyr? Could that help the cause even more? Or could it backfire? What what is what is your thought on that? Yeah, that's a good question. I honestly, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it could go all of the different ways with all of the different details of each scenario. Um, I do know, um, I texted with her husband yesterday that he said the the worst case scenario of all would be that the, the the case would get dropped. I mean, he he's in he's incredibly he's in full support of her, and she I think feels you know that that it, 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 no matter what happens, finally these individual stories are told. These these chickens. I mean, we all. I'll speak for myself until I spent a significant amount of time with them. Um, at a sanctuary, a, a group of Kaporo birds. I, I, I just thought they were birds. It was like I, I think I think because we tend to connect more with mammals because we are ego driven and we connect with with those that are more like us. The further away we get from ourselves, the the harder it is for us to understand others. Um, but so that's why it's, t it's taken you know so long for for people to really be able to see and understand these intricate characters that are all birds, right? Of course, we love some birds and, and, eat, and eat others. Um, but she so badly wants this light to be shown on these lives. And she wants to bring forth um, the, the torture of them and not just their death. And I actually have a question for Nathan, if you don't mind, Jane. I was really curious if the whole point of this case on the DXE side is about the torture and the treatment, what would be the reasons that uh, they would not be allowed to show the footage that goes on inside this particular slaughterhouse that has been invest investigated many times uh, for its treatment of these birds? What, what, what would be the reasons that would come up that they would get away with not having to show this footage? Nathan. Dotsy, I would guess that their argument is going to be that what go goes on inside is irrelevant 
to what you're seeing on video right now, that this mm -hmm. case is simple. This case is two people approaching a truck and stealing property. Now that's going, that's, that's their view of the, of the evidence. Um, they obviously are going to say that because they don't want anybody to look under the hood. Right. And, but from the defense standpoint, what goes on inside is everything because it goes to the, it goes to Alexandra and Alicia's state of mind. You know, why did they do what they did? They're admitting that they took the birds. That's not, that's not an issue here, but is there a justification to doing it? Is it stealing or is it rescue? Um, and the prosecution does not want the defense to make that case. More than that, they don't want the light shined on the horrors that are inside because, you know, arguably they're in cahoots with the industry. Um, the prosecutors have discretion. They have discretions whether to bring cases, whether to go forward with cases that they've brought, whether to offer plea deals or whether to dismiss cases. And they've made several decisions all along here. They've 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 gone forward with the case. They've made plea offers, I suspect, because they really don't want the light shined on this case. Mm -hmm. um, but they have made the decision not to dismiss the case. And, you know, it's very brave of Alexandra to not want the case dismissed. You know, from a lawyer's standpoint, you always want your client's case dismissed. But this is bigger than this is bigger than the clients. And Alexandra sees this as bigger than herself. And to dismiss it would be the end would, would probably be the end of it um but for, i want to i want to jump in and just say that they're using what they're calling the necessity defense because there was an undercover investigation of this slaughterhouse by foster of uh, the foster farm slaughterhouse by dxe and uh, that was written up in an opinion piece in the new york times and based on what they saw which we can show you in a second um that's when DXC went to the district attorney of that county and said, prosecute, prosecute the slaughterhouse for what we're saying are violations of law, of anti-cruelty laws. And there was no prosecution. Um, and that's what they're calling the, ne the necessity defense. Let's hear Alexandra, the defendant, explain that. Chaos at the high slaughter speeds that workers are pressured to meet. Living birds sometimes get mistaken for dead ones and are thrown in the trash alive. I knew that this cruel fate was waiting for birds on that slaughter truck. I knew the conditions that they were raised in by foster farms left many of them injured, infected, and disabled. DXE had tried reporting these criminal conditions to the authorities, but we were ignored. All right, we want to go out to Carla. Carla, I see people leaving court. Can you uh, try to get some uh, information there? Hi, yeah, let me bring, let me point. The, the There's Alexander Paul. Uh, in private proceedings. Um, the early motion practice was not something that should have been sealed from the public. So the state basically made a number of motions essentially trying to gag everyone, including the defendants. They tried to ask the judge to issue an order indicating that the defendants could not post anything about the case at all, which if you're following another case, we're involved in Osher Farm. You know, there's unfortunately at least one precedent for that it's highly unconstitutional the judge frankly did not even really seriously entertain it thankfully so um alexandra alicia free to continue posting on social media the prosecution also targeted all of you yeah. they were upset <laughs> about the red ribbons and you know but it was it was pretty great we made very good arguments chris made some great arguments and you know basically said this is a first amendment issue there's no threat of jury tainting or intimidation just because people are wearing red ribbons i mean i think some of the examples that are given in the case law involve things like threats against jurors. This is not threatening your juror. It's not going to sway a juror in some fundamental way and convince him that it's dangerous to vote one way or the other in the in the deliberation room. It was funny. The judge even said himself, "Well, are you going to tell them they can't wear white shirts too? What if they came in white shirts tomorrow? <laughs> What's next? Do we have? I mean, so it was it was good, and uh, and the judge ruled against him on that." Um, Long deliberation. Also, in, the jurors yeah. going in and out. Were, trying know, to have the, the jurors, jurors go out. To, to, to yeah, so out. there was a request to have the jurors go out to the back because of a threat of jury 
intimidation, painting, or something like that. The you judge. Yeah, by you, you guys, <laughs> they kept they kept referring to it as a protest, and I said, I, I don't see this as a protest. I think it's a demonstration. It's a peaceful gathering of people in support of these two wonderful human beings. And so the judge basically denied all the motions today. Um, there was a little bit of discussion about media attention that was less clear to me. The the judge, you know, I think rightfully, unfortunately, under the rules, didn't allow recording of the voir dire process because there's a court rule in the Kenya, you're not allowed to record. Initially, the prosecutor was trying to say there could be no media coverage of voir dire, though. And we pushed back on that. And ultimately, the prosecutor actually reread the rule and realized we were correct that you can't prohibit public access to voir dire. It's a part of the courtroom proceeding. And in the United States, unlike in many countries, court is in public. You can't hide these proceedings. We believe in the rule of law. We believe in democracy. We believe that before you're going to send someone to prison at least or jail, you're entitled to have everyone hear and see exactly why you're doing it. You know, and, and that's a very important right that we shouldn't take for granted. So I'm glad the prosecution pulled back from that request. But most of the time, honestly, was spent, well, most of the time was just sitting waiting right this morning because the reason, I don't know if you all heard this, but the reason uh, for the delay was the visiting judge who was supposed to preside in Department 5 became sick with COVID. Yeah. And so there was a judge jumping back and forth between two courtrooms to try and cover completely different dockets. So that was the reason for the main delay. But in the afternoon, the delay was just, there were a pretty significant percentage of the jurors, I think it was 31 or 32 out of 78, who said they had some hardship. So many times the judge would just allow them all to go, but because we need to get to 15 jurors or 14 jurors by the end of this proceeding, the judge actually sat down and individually deliberated with each of them and asked them what your hardship was. And most of them were granted, but quite a few of them, you know, who said like, oh, I just, you know, I don't want to come and it's going to hurt me a little financially. And this is kind of annoying for me to be here. The judge said, now you're coming back. So, yeah, but it was interesting. Um, kind of emotional. Like whenever you're hearing jurors talk about hardship, there were some very legitimate cases. One woman was crying about a situation. I don't want to share the personal details because it was held in, in kind of the judge's chambers for a reason, because when people are sharing their personal troubles, you don't want to broadcast to the public, but it, um, I mean, on the one hand, it, it makes me think, you know, I'm glad our system reflects those sorts of concerns by individuals who are going through some sort of suffering. On the other hand, as you've seen, the criminal justice system is not very efficient. It, it takes a long time, and it's not the fault of any particular judge or even any particular prosecutor, but it just shows me once again how much we have to do to make the system better for people who, even before they're convicted, are facing extrajudicial punishment. It's just months and months of waiting, bureaucracy conditions of release, all these things that add up. And even the jurors are, you know, frustrated by the experience in many cases because it's just so hard. And it, it reminds me again, just how absurd this entire prosecution is. They're wasting so much time and money for so many people to go after two women who just tried to help two suffering animals. It's not right. That's why I'm glad you're all here. To support Thank them. you yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so the schedule for tomorrow is jury selection will begin again tomorrow. They're probably going to be calling another 50 jurors, or not probably, they will be, because for us to see the panel of 14, which is what we want to get to, we're probably going to need 50 more, which means we'll probably go through hardship selection again, just asking the jurors if they have some hardship in their life that prevents them from serving, which means all of you will be probably kicked out of the room. Uh, by the afternoon, I'm hoping when we actually go through attorney-led voir dire, when we're asking them questions about their potential biases and their background, hopefully there'll be enough seats in the in the courtroom that you'll be allowed to enter. And it's possible we'll get the opening statements tomorrow. I would guess we don't get the opening tomorrow. I'm guessing voir dire alone is going to take the entire day, but it's possible we get the opening. So, and if we don't get the opening, I think it's reasonably likely we'll have some motions we argue tomorrow, which, again, will be open to the public. Yeah. One thing they did say, unfortunately, today, I haven't even sure if I'm here yet, but the judge is not going to allow live streaming or Zoom. So I think there's going to be a recording, or at least there's not going to be Zoom access. There might be a video camera allowed in the courtroom, and maybe that video camera can broadcast to the media more generally, but there's not going to be an active Zoom for people to join into, which is unfortunate, because I know a lot of people, including your husband, would love to be able to participate in this proceeding. So. Oh, thanks, you all. And he also here. said that the good thing is, is that the judge didn't seem in a hurry for us to get over with. Sometimes judges, this one told the jury that it might be a two-week two week trial. trial. Yeah, so, so it's I mean, longer than we had even predicted. And we had been pretty aggressive about predicting the amount of time. I think he's trying to be safe mm. and make sure all the jurors who ultimately sit on the jury don't have to leave. 
it's in a midstream for some reason because they have the surgery scheduled or you know the flying out of the country something like that so but yeah i mean th getting this judge to us was a victory because this is a fair judge it's an open judge he ruled for us on the subpoena in Boston Farms, which is the right legal ruling. Bye, Kevin. Bye, Kevin. Bye, in, a, in a county where Foster Farms is, you know, one of, if not the largest private employer in the entire county, I think a judge who's willing to be fair is a victim. And I think so far this judge has shown at least a willingness to be open to all perspectives and a rule based on the law rather than on the political leanings of the people in power in this county. So that's good. I don't know how boring it was for all of you <laughs> in the hall all day, but thank you. It means so much to us. Oh, yeah. Thanks. So thank you. Yeah. It will be the same judge for the rest of the case. And oh. to the extent voir dire is allowed, I think voir dire is actually one of the most, it's certainly one of the most important parts of the case. The attorney led voir dire. You know, the, the hardship voir dire is just, you know, does someone have surgery planned next week? But when we actually get to the question of bias, it's, it's going to be our only opportunity to hear from the jury during the case. I mean, jurors can ask questions potentially if the judge allows it, but the more deliberative kind of thoughtful discussions of jurors only happen during voir dire. And for those of you who are there in North Carolina, I think a lot of you were there. It was, it was actually kind of powerful, you know, hearing the jurors talk about animals. So I don't know how much time this judge is going to give us because he's trying to move us along. He said he was going to give each side 20 minutes to engage in voir dire. And just to give you by way of comparison, in North Carolina, it took two days. So we're going to try and do in 20 minutes what in North Carolina we did in two days. And Utah is about a day and a half. But he also said, look, I, I just want to make sure you're using the time effectively. I'm not going to put a hard limit on it. And I think when the judge starts seeing some of the answers we're getting and the fact that we are probing the question that we have to probe, which is whether someone will be biased against the defendants in some way, he'll probably give us a little leash. But we'll see. We'll see. The bailiff did, so because some of the jurors have been dismissed, like who knows, but the bailiff did seem to think that there was going to be like space in the courtroom yeah. tomorrow. So hopefully we don't spend the entire day sitting in the hallway. Um, and I think like, as far as you know, like if there's space, we can be in there tomorrow. Yeah. Jury so. selection is open to the public. The problem is they called 50 more. So 50 more people are going to be filling the room. I mean, if it's 50 people called, my guess is 40 will show up. Yeah. So there'll be 40 more people in the room tomorrow. Hopefully after a hardship in the morning, the courtroom will be pretty clear and it'll be down to like 30 or 40 and 18 of them in the box. So, you know, I'm hoping people can start trickling in. Uh, How do we know if the jury will be allowed to ask questions like they did in Utah? Because that was really awesome. Yeah, you know, we should actually request that because I agree I think it's important for the jury to have a voice in this case. And there is an instruction in California you can request. And so we should ask it. And judge, I don't that has to grant it. And it's not standard practice, but, you know, I think it's worth asking. So I'm glad you brought it up because we had actually been thinking about that instruction. We probably should be asking. For it. So it's a good suggestion, Curtis. You were in North Carolina too, right? Or were you? Yeah. Yeah. So you've seen two of them. You know yeah. how this goes. So you've got to be really worried about my new... <laughs> Madu here? Are you gonna stare anyone down again? Madu? No, we're just kidding. Madu didn't stare anyone down. There are false allegations against Mad Dog Madu in North Carolina. <laughs> we love you. Yeah. Does anyone have any other questions? Do you have any questions? Thank you. It's pretty interesting, by the way, that it's it's not just three members of the DA's office, but the supervisor yeah. for. I, who's a higher up at the DA's office is like watching the entire thing, which is pretty unusual. This morning, I'm a little confused as to why he's there. This morning, when we were all here, the, I did see the prosecutor drive by. He was like, he, I mean, he was probably looking for parking, maybe, but he did look slightly like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they didn't, they didn't want people here. Wait, I got a quick question for you. Came time to talk about that email yeah. that Atwell got from Foster Farms. Yeah, it was when we were basically addressing whether Foster Farms witness was going to be allowed to testify. And we raised some arguments in the court. I don't want to belabor the point too much. You'll hear this in argument tomorrow, but Foster Farms is trying to pull a complete 180 on us. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a tactic that lawyers often use. It's highly inappropriate to basically hide your strategy until the last minute and claim that, Oh, we just didn't know. We, we, you know, we got all the evidence. We, we, we need to present a trial just two days ago. And so we're giving it to you now, but we, you know, they're changing the complete theory, their theory of, of the case completely. 
They're calling a new expert witness who's making all these allegations against Alexandra and Alicia that are going to be harder for us to defend, partly because we're just not prepared for it. So one of the big early fights is going to be whether we can keep that out because it's highly inappropriate. Under the law, they're supposed to give us all their documents and witnesses 30 days before trial. We're two days before trial. We're actually starting trial, and they still haven't given us everything. So that's going to be a big and important fight that probably will be fought, I'm guessing, tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, we, that's, we, that's when the supervisor came in. Yeah. It's basically when yeah. Foster Farms is interest in their witnesses are being implicated. Yep. Question from Jane? Yeah, sir. Yeah, and Mick has a question too. Um, obviously in your last case, whether you could show the footage of the factory um, was a huge issue. Will you be able to show your undercover investigative footage of the chicken slaughterhouse? We don't know yet. Don't know yet. I will say we're cautiously optimistic the, the prior judge or commissioner actually granted all of our motions in limine. We won every motion argument, but he granted them provisionally um, and said that basically, I can see your argument, but I'm going to need what's called an offer of proof. In other words, I want you to mock up what your testimony, what your videos, you know, what your exhibits are going to be, photographs you want to share with the jury. Show it to me first, and then I'll decide if there's substantial evidence for the defenses you're trying to, to use in this case that would justify the inclusion of the evidence. But even the fact that we passed that threshold is an important victory because in Utah and North Carolina, we had very biased judges in agricultural counties who didn't even really allow us to have a proffer. You know, we weren't even allowed to present the proof and the evidence for the judge to consider. So for example, in North Carolina, the judge ruled this evidence on day one with no argument at all and didn't even look at the evidence we had to provide. Um, in Utah, you know, the judge didn't grant us the opportunity to even get the documents. When we asked for the documents of animal cruelty in the prosecution's hands, the judge said, no, you're not getting anything. So not only were we not allowed to present evidence of animal cruelty, we weren't able to even able to access it. Well, in this case, you know, the judge, I think, rightfully did grant our subpoena request to Foster Farms saying, you've got to give us evidence of any diseased animals at Foster Farms. And he actually just reiterated today. So I'm right when I get home, I'm going to email Foster Farms Council and tell them the judge signed the or order hand over the documents. We need to find out what diseases and injuries and sicknesses these animals are afflicted with, because it's not just a danger to the chickens, it's a danger to the public. Mm -hmm. Granted, we care about both, obviously. We care, even if the sicknesses are not causing a danger to human beings, but just because the animals themselves are suffering, that, that's a harm that should be averted. But unfortunately, sometimes we have to leverage the interests of human beings to help animals. And this is one of those cases where I think the interests of human beings and animals are like served by having more transparency about what diseases are afflicting animals at factory farms. Okay? Yeah, and cool. uh, Mick had a quick question, and so did Donnie, if you would indulge us. Mick, go ahead. Well, you know, Wayne, the brilliant guy that he is and the brilliant attorney that he is, he kind of answered my question. I wanted to find out what the status was of the subpoena, or uh, rather yeah. the, of the motion that the judge had granted with regards to the health, or in this case, you know, disease, levels of yeah. the birds um so, when, yeah when granted it get the documents yeah he granted it and he 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 updated the order saying that they would have to disclose all their documents by wednesday at 5 p.m which you know frankly is not sufficient because i mean we're going to be in the thick of trial and getting all these documents that we have to try and review and then decide how we can use it to defend alicia and alexandra these documents should have been handed to us a month ago but we'll take them if we can get them tomorrow we'll take them and donnie you have a question yeah. Hi, Wayne. I understand that the the uh, prosecution offered the defendants multiple deals and they didn't take the deals. Uh, why do you suppose that the DA isn't dropping the charges altogether in light of the fact that they so desperately wanted to make a deal clearly? And in light of the fact that there's footage, video footage online that people can easily access showing what goes on inside of Foster Farms. Why is Foster Farms not instructing the DA to drop the charges is a strategy to avoid a spotlight that's going to be yeah. on them. Foster Farms is not only declining to drop the charges, they're aggressively pursuing the case. Yeah. I, I have now spoken with their attorneys on at least four occasions, and I've honestly been shocked by how much they are pushing this. You know, it, it was actually pretty interesting. In the, in the prior hearing, I, I'm trying to remember if this is on Zoom or it was in person. I think it, I feel like it was in person. The judge who was on this case before this judge actually asked the question at the end of the hearing, you know, are you sure the victim wants to proceed with this case? Yeah. And that's a highly unusual question for a judge to ask. But even the judge was kind of skeptical this is a good thing for the company. And the prosecutor said, yes, I've talked to them. And, and I could say, having talked to the Foster Farms attorneys and 
heard from some of their high level executives now who are going to be testifying in trial. I think they're chomping up the bit to come after these two women. I think the reason is they're not dumb enough to think they're not going to take some PR damage from going after our friends, but they also think we have to stop this somehow, mm -hmm. you know, and they think that the only way to stop this is to deter future investigations <laughs> and rescues of this sort. And the test for movement is, is going to be, will that happen? Will we be scared? All this, will this just inspire us to fight even harder next time? And, and I think Foster Farms is, is in for a surprise if they think that prosecuting these two women is going to scare the rest of us from exposing their misconduct, because it's not. Okay? I mean, you all are welcome to see it. I'm not a typical criminal defense attorney, so I think <laughs> talk to the defendants. I mean, be careful. Yeah. Oh, uh, so the reason criminal defense attorneys usually say don't say anything is because your statements can be used against you in court. So defense attorneys are usually terrified. But my perspective on this is very different from normal criminal defense attorneys because I think these two women should be proud of what they did. There's nothing for them to be ashamed of. They don't have to worry about being impeached or being deemed as non-credible because their truth is true. And their truth is powerful. Their truth is inspiring. So. Well, I mean, you should talk to your attorney. I can't speak. <laughs> but Alexandra, I'm your attorney. I, you know, I have always told you, you can say whatever the hell you want, Alexandra. Speak your truth and I'll, I'll be behind you. It's my, it's my problem to fix things if there's a problem. It's your problem is to try and help the animals. And that means speaking your truth. So. All right. Nathan, you were going to jump in with a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, Wayne, it's Nathan. How are you? Um, did you get any rulings from the judge regarding defenses that going to provide you with that? And then it sounds like we are gonna I'll send an alert after, but we're probably gonna be at the All right. We're uh monitoring the situation. Uh frankly, we're the only ones live uh uh media organization covering this. Everybody should be live. It's historic. We'll look back in history and say, wow. We were all there when history was made, for sure. Let's uh, peek it again, and then we'll we'll recap. Okay, uh, she's not letting us unmute. I guess uh, she's um, muted a little bit, but I want to get the reaction. So, Dotsie, what's your reaction? You saw your good friend there, uh, you know, walking out of court, uh, really cheerful. Um, sometimes I think I'm more worried about these people going to jail than they are. I know. First, I wanted to get her a coat because she looks so cold. <laughs> it looks really chilly up there. But she, she, you know what? She she is just incredibly compassionate. She's so wise. She no way she will back down. She'll always defend the defenseless. She is just. She was born for this work, and she has said that before. And I, I'm just proud to know her, as I, I know that you all are on this 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 panel tonight. And uh, yeah, she doesn't seem at all scared or concerned. Mm -hmm. I will say that I once, um, when I was a newscaster, was assigned to be arrested, literally arrested, and put in jail for an evening. And um, by the way, there are photos of me, um, mug shots without any explanation all over the internet. So if you see them, I wasn't actually arrested. But I had, I actually forgot that it was, that it was just a, uh, you know, a series. And I started to feel really, really persecuted and upset. You have to take your clothes off and they examine you and then they drag you. I mean, it's dehumanizing. It's dehumanizing. This is no small sacrifice. I will remember till the day I die that experience of being locked up. And of course I was like, vegan options, please, through the bars. <laughs> but um, we're going to go back now to Carla Carla, can you hear us? Carla. Carla. There you go. Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Do you want to say hi to Jane and everybody? Oh, oh hey. I can't see you, but uh, hey, thank you so much for all the work that you do and the support for us both. It's incredible. How are you feeling emotionally? How are you holding Oh, how, I'm feeling great. We have such support here. There are Dozens of people here, um, and I'm being uh, represented by Wayne Shung, and he is an amazing, amazing attorney, really. And my co-defendant, Alicia Santurio, is also just such a support. We're going to be sitting next to each other uh, in the courtroom. 
And uh, are you convinced we'll get a fair jury? I, know, I think we'll get it. We have a very fair judge. He seems to be very fair. And I think that the courts will try hard to get a fair jury. Yes. Now, I know Nathan wanted to ask a question of, uh, of Wayne, but ask it of Alexandra, Nathan, our attorney, former district attorney. Hi, Nathan. I know. I know. Nathan. Is that Nathan Semmel? Yes. Ask uh, me, Nathan. You know, I was curious as to whether there have been any rulings yet from the judge cases that are going to be available to you and to Alicia, like necessity or um, right of claim, or you know, how, if he ruled on on the value issue, things like that, that um, you might be able to put forward to the to the jury. Okay, great. So, so I'm sorry, I didn't hear all that because there's such a hubbub around here. You're asking about what motions you think will be um, will be able to put forth before the jury? What, defense, what, def what defenses you might be able to put before the jury, like necessity? We're looking at value, necessity, claim of right, claim of right, and advice of counsel. Those are the the motions that Wayne's going to be putting forth. And we, we need to go before the judge to 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 uh, be find the parameters. The judge might say, "No, you can't, you can't uh, say this was a necessity case." We're hoping for that. We've already got value, uh, which is extremely important. That was ruled in our favor, and um, so fingers crossed. We we got it. We we had a lot of wins today, actually. Even though we haven't even <laughs> really started, I see my I see my co-host Dotsie Bausch there. I just wanted to say hi. Hi, Dotsie. Thank you so much. <laughs> I can't see anybody else. Y'all are so small. Go get <laughs> them, Alexandra. That's a mile away. Go get them. I've never seen a happier defendant in my entire life. Um, <laughs> you know what's funny? Is the jury's coming in, they're thinking, oh my God, I got to do this petty theft case and those two women. What the hell are they doing stealing a chicken? They don't know what they're getting into. It's going to be the most interesting case in Merced for decades if they, if they get on the jury. Do you feel you're making history? Because I feel you're making history. Oh, it's so sweet. You know, Look, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Wayne and Paul Picklesheimer before me. There's people who are fighting the good fight. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm just one of many animal activists trying to make a change for animals. Well, you are our hero. You are amazing. And uh, I'm just uh, so impressed by your lack of fear. Uh, are you just suppressing it or you, you don't feel it? <laughs> I don't feel it. I truly feel, and I told this to Dotsie last week, I said, I'm not, it's not real. It's like I'm not it's here. It's right like uh, Jax the chicken is really here. I'm here because I'm a human, I'm, and I have the right to go to court, and Jax doesn't. And because he doesn't, I'm his proxy. Wow, that is so amazing. Well, I hope that when they do the history of how animal rights became a legal right for animals, they cover this and this case, because I really feel like you will go down in history. And uh, you know, uh, I just, I'm just so proud of you and, and impressed by your, your gumption. How many times have you been arrested, Alexandra? <laughs> Two dozen, I think, but I have never had the opportunity to go before a jury because usually uh, those big corporations, they drop the charges or uh, the judges, I guess, just send you to jail. But no, this is my first time with the jury trial. And I'm so lucky to have um, Wayne Chung as my attorney. I mean, I'm lucky to have Alexandra the court. No, because most criminal attorneys will just their focus will be to get their defendant off. And that is great. And I admire them. But in these kind of cases, it's not about getting the defendants off. It's about getting the message out. And it's a, it's a bigger message. And Wayne understands that like no other criminal attorney. And that's why I'm so, so fortunate. Are you going to take the stand? I uh, know. Yeah, I mean, I... It's, she doesn't have to disclose. I mean, you could say if you like. Yeah, I'm going to. Yeah. <laughs> I can. Because Jax wants me to. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Well, I've never seen a happier group come out of a courthouse in my life except after an acquittal. So uh, I, I, I'll have what you're having. 
uh, amazing, <laughs> absolutely amazing work. And, it's uh, just, you know what? It's it's a win that we got this far because we did think that Foster Farms was going to drop this case. Up this morning they could drop it. I don't know. Can they still drop it? They can still dismiss the charges against you. And I, I won't say it's a win that they didn't drop it because dropping the case is a victory in a lot of ways too because it shows that they don't have the moral, you know, the moral standing, the standing to continue to pursue an unjust criminal case. But but I know this trial is important to you. It's important to to what you're trying to achieve for Ethan Jackson for the other animals that are being mistreated by Foster Farms and. We will seize the opportunity for the yep. next few days. But so far, you know, we appreciate you, Jane. Thanks, thanks to all of you for covering the case. We really appreciate it. You're amazing. I, I know you're you're busy. You need to rest up for tomorrow. We'll let you go. Thank you so much. Absolutely amazing. Bye, amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, Daddy. <laughs> I just want to get everybody's reaction. Because it's one thing doing it, but it's another thing doing it with panache and flair and this this attitude. Um, I just I'm blown away. Uh, Ellen Dent, Animal Alliance Network, your reaction. I think they're all coming out cool and calm and with big smiles because they know that they're doing the right thing. They're speaking up for other animals. Uh, they're bringing us one step closer to getting rights for other animals, which is what we've dedicated our lives to, what we've dedicated our activism to. So, uh, you know, I just, I think that they're, they're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing and they're exactly where they need to be to achieve uh, the goals that they're looking, uh, you know, to get. Wow. Uh, and there's Aria, a little uh, beautiful, your beautiful, beautiful girl. Let's um, get, you know, reaction from everybody to what we've just heard, Donnie Moss. So, I mean, my first reaction was listening to both Wayne and Alexandra is just their humility. I mean, these are people who have done so much for the animal rights movement, really taking it to the next level, but they speak in such a way that they're just, you know, just two individuals doing their thing. I mean, they're they are like legends in, in the movement. Their humility is really it really struck me and their courage too. I mean, I think also, I think we see their, their, um, uh, their confidence because they know they're on the right side of history here. So even if the defendants lose, they still know that they're not criminals. Uh, they're freedom fighters and you can kind of see that in their tone. So it was just, it was really, I'm so glad we got to hear them speak after the first day, uh, in court. Absolutely. Thanks to the amazing Carla Cabral. You're going to be snapped up by ABC or NBC or CBS in a couple of days. I'm not kidding. Um, just amazing work. So why don't we go to Mick Davoudian? Um, what is your reaction to seeing their seeing and sensing their attitude? Well, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, uh, in theory, they are not in theory. In reality, they could go to jail, so they're facing jail time. But I think uh, the end result of in their mind is if that happens, that's what they've been working towards. So she's not afraid of that eventuality. But the reality is it's a happy day. It, it looks like things have gone really well in court for everyone. So, I mean, it's really exciting. I right, well, let me let me uh, kind of go back in time. Uh, May of 2018 is when I um, first met um, Alexandra and we were at Petaluma uh, at the Sunshine Farms. Uh, it was a big protest. And I was among uh, the hundreds of people in the sidelines in the so-called green group, right? So we're kind of the safe group. We didn't cross the boundary of the private property. So we weren't directly in jeopardy of being arrested. And then there was the, I think the yellow team. And then of course, Alexandra was um, part of, a, I think 80 or so people who were in the red team who actually went in and brought out the animals. And I remember um, they were bringing up people one after the other arrested. And I remember the cop coming over to uh, ask Alexandra to put her arms behind her so they could cuff her. And she, we, everybody was holding flowers in their hands. I think that we were holding white flowers. And she kind of went like, well, okay, I have, I have a flower in my hand. What do I do? And then she handed it to the cop that was going to arrest her, uh, that was going to put her in cuffs. And it was the most unbelievable um, moment because 
she got cuffed she got put put away taken away put in a truck i can't remember where they took her but then i noticed the cop went and put the flower on the door handle of the patrol car which was unbelievable in other words he was being sympathetic in a very quiet way yes yes and you know we've seen that so often uh, I have to go back to Ellen Dent on this because, in, you know, when you were organizing your vigils outside the pig slaughterhouse near downtown L.A., didn't one of the police officers go vegan? Didn't you have great relationships with the police officers, Ellen? <laughs> I know you're unmuting. Yes, it looks like you, the screen is frozen. She might be frozen. Okay, but um, we'll we'll come back to. Uh, let me ask you, uh, Carla. You're out there now. Everybody's gone for the day, but this this was a very powerful day. Uh, even if it's disappointing that there weren't wasn't more local news coverage. I mean, shame on the San Francisco Chronicle and all of these places for not being there. Um, and the local news, my God, you know. Uh, it reminds me of the time, and I'll just say this, I was at a DXE protest at the San Francisco Ferry Building, and it was one of the most dramatic protests I've ever seen. It's a very long, historic building, a foodie center now with a bunch of meat and dairy products, and DXE had a die-in from one end of the San Francisco Ferry Building to the other, extraordinarily dramatic. Guess who was the only one? videotaping it and going live for media, me, the San Francisco Chronicle, all of these, they literally did like, oh, they showed two people crossing the street and said some group blocked traffic. They refused to cover it. Okay. And they're all invited on anytime they want. Um, it, it's, it's, it will go down in history as, uh, an abrogation of journalistic duty not to cover these stories more thoroughly. Uh, your thoughts on that, Carla, because you're out there being our fantastic reporter. Thank God. Well, I'm just so, so proud to be here and be able to help uh, bring this to light. And I would say that you have to remember, obviously, there are a lot of stories that don't get covered that should get covered. And a lot of it, of course, has to do with the billion dollar industries, all of the industries that, uh, you know, shake each other's hands and deals are done. And, and it makes it very difficult, I think, a lot of times for reporters to to come and and cover these sorts of stories. So I'm, I'm just so grateful that you are covering it. Oh, we're all doing it together. I think we've got Ellen Dent back. What I was saying was when you had your vigils at the Farmer John Slaughterhouse, you had support from the police there. You had a good relationship and a lot of them supported you in a sense. Absolutely. And even a few of them transitioned uh, to veganism or were trying to transition to veganism after seeing uh, the pigs on the trucks after making that connection. And uh, we were also able to get a lot of mainstream media as well, a lot of mainstream media coverage uh, for the vigils, uh, for other act, um, activist uh, events that we had. Uh, so, yeah, it it's hard to get the mainstream media there. And, and you would think that such a big celebrity, like someone who's been on Baywatch and been in so many movies would be able to get them out there. Um, but it is very, very difficult. And, uh, but once you start getting it rolling, uh, like how it's on, on the New York Times, uh, you never do know. Hopefully other mainstream media outlets will pick this up, but I'm just so grateful uh, to Unchained TV for making sure that this coverage isn't lost. And we hear from Carla that she's going to try to bring us the protest. They're going to do these folks, by the way, they're they're They don't get tired. I don't know how, but like they started eight in the morning and like four in the morning, they're marching and doing things. And it's like the energizer bunnies. So um, we're hoping that Carla will be able to bring us that. Um, so, you know, I, I want to just go to the big picture, Nathan, you know, these trials are like roller coasters, and I've seen that. You see days, for example, we go back to the uh, Michael Jackson trial, which I covered, uh, one of the most uh, media from around the world, hundreds of 
hundreds of media outlets. And at the very first day, it was considered almost an open and shut case. Um, and then, of course, it, it ended up that Michael Jackson was acquitted on all counts. However, whatever you think, OK, he was acquitted. So you never know what's going to happen in these trials, especially high profile trials. Correct, Nathan? Oh, it's true. I mean, you could have a you could have a good morning and a horrible afternoon and you can think that you have no chance. And then, you know, you speak to an a, an alternate juror and they are there with you. Um, you just you just don't know. Um, there are a lot of highs and lows in a trial. What's what's interesting about this one in particular, and I think Alexandra and Wayne highlighted it, is they really, you know, in their minds, they, they can't lose. This, this is the win. They, they, they are shining a light on what we all know is one of the biggest um, horrors of, um, of humanity. And this is the only way, sadly, to do it. I wish more celebrities would, would use their profile um, and get involved and speak out about um, you know factory farms and and um, and agriculture um, to somehow level the playing field. Uh, you know, you've said we've we've discussed how there's there's just no media there. You know, you, you, if you turn on MSNBC or CNN right now, there's a good chance you're going to see a fast food co commercial. You know, that about chicken. Um, it, you, can you imagine if right before that commercial, they're covering this trial? The only way to level the playing field is to get, you know, more people who are willing to take the chances that these brave people are and, and hope that it, uh, it, it levels the playing field. And when celebrities use their platform, you know, use, use their standing um to make a statement it it really it, it gives us it gives us a shot um so i think they feel like um no matter what the result is they 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 win because they're bringing attention i just want to say one last thing which is you know we all talk about you know she faces six months they face they they face six months in jail um and you know donnie's talked about his his night in jail i've spent the night in jail um it's a horrible place um and when you are that selfless uh and be willing to to spend a week a month years because you believe in the cause it's not something that we should thumb our nose at jail is 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 hell on earth you are stripped of all your rights all your dignity um you are you know in a lot of cases emotionally physically mentally brutalized and to be willing to do it, knowing that you can face six months of that uh, and walk out of that building with a smile because you know you're doing the right thing is just an amazing thing. Well said. We can't underestimate how difficult jail is. I mean, you don't know what can happen behind bars. It's a very grueling unpleasant experience i told you i pretended to be in jail for one night and i lost it um it's it's not fun you have to have a certain type of personality to be willing to take that kind of risk and that kind of commitment and it's it's really a form of martyrdom is what i would say i mean let's not mince words here dotsie bausch your friend who you do a podcast with switch for good podcast is a martyr yeah, no doubt. And and I mean, my words aren't important. Her words just ring um, so true. And, and she really, she was born to do this work. I mean, she's a great actress, but she was born to do this animal rights work. And she really, you know, Nathan, as you know, she spent multiple nights in jail. So she's not like, oh, it won't be that bad. I mean, she knows it's that bad. And she said, truly, honestly, this is not about winning or losing, which is, you know, what we're talking about, because it's a case and it's a trial. It is to establish a precedent of a right to rescue. And this will go down in, in, in history books, whether the mainstream media carries it or not, this, this is going to be felt on a national level to the 95% one day, no doubt, because of her bravery and because of Alicia's. 
And throughout history, you know, media mm -hmm. has failed to cover um, the unpleasant stories that most people would rather forget. And uh, I've seen that in, in various um, museums where they talk about oppression. And one of the mm -hmm. constant themes is that the media of that day, whether it's the newspapers or whatever, refuse to cover what's going on in it, whatever persecuted community happens to be uh, being persecuted at that time. That is a, you know, a hallmark of, I would call it cowardly journalism. Uh, it's, it's, it's really sad that it's also a bipartisan problem. It's not just one side of the aisle. I mean, um, progressive news outlets um, say things like, uh, well, we can't do, I just heard this the other day. I, I won't mention his name, but he's a top uh, uh, host on a very, on the most progressive channel. We can't do without eggs and milk. Oh yes. Yes, we can do without eggs and cow's milk. Um, it's just um, unbelievable. Like uh, the blinders. And I do feel like as climate change accelerates and it becomes less and less possible to ignore the role of animal agriculture in the impending climate apocalypse when Donnie Moss is the moment where they can no longer ignore this issue, when it's so hot that UPS delivery people, I read an article, are in the summertime, they're collapsing on the street, where in Kansas, there was a videotape of thousands of cows dead from the heat and drought with their legs up in the air. Um, look at the cyclone bombs of cold in the winter. As climate change gets more intense, when are they going to have to look at animal agriculture's role in it, which is massive, and it's not being discussed at all, Donnie? You know, Jane, it could be that before climate change is what really moves the needle. It could be that the next pandemic, which could be much more deadly than COVID and have a much greater impact on our lives than COVID did, that could be uh, the 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 defining moment where people make the switch. But you know. Climate change is, move, is moving forward, whether, you know, regardless of whether uh, the climate activists and the mainstream public is embracing it as the most one of the most important issues of our time, that it will affect our future. And it's not just climate change. Jane, as you know, you've often uh, referenced, it's also, you know, things that are happening right now, you know, deforestation, uh, animal agriculture is a leading cause of deforestation, um, species extinction, ocean dead zones, antibiotic resistance, pandemics, MERS, SARS, bird flu, swine flu, COVID. You know, that wasn't animal agriculture, but that was, you know, could very well have come from consuming animals. And cruelty, just who we are as, as an animal, doing what we're, we're doing to all the other animals. There's so many reasons that we have to go move, make the switch to plant-based diets right now. Uh, obviously, climate change is is the biggest one, but I'm not sure that's going to be the one that is the that is that defining moment that you were just referencing. It could be an avian flu pandemic. It was in the New York Times yesterday, Jane. There was a big story about whether or not all of the chickens in factory farms should be vaccinated for avian flu because if yes, the current that. if the current strain of avian flu mutates into a strain that can be transferred from human to human, and it's much more deadly than COVID, and we know that already, then we could have another global pandemic on our hands that's much bigger than COVID. Yeah, I mean, it, it, what I find so fascinating is the best and the brightest, which, by the way, was a sarcastic title, if you read the book. The best and the brightest brought us the Vietnam quagmire. Uh, but the best and the brightest who can, you know, analyze things that I personally found cha challenging, like the Mueller report. OK, I mean, things that are really difficult. We're talking road scholars. They still can't get it through their heads that eight billion humans killing 80 billion land animals every year. OK, killing more animals in one day than all the human beings that have died in all of human history, that there's something wrong with that and that it's not sustainable. I mean, that to me is the thing that just blows my mind beyond comprehension. We're pretty much ending our broadcast for today. So maybe we can get some thoughts on that as we wrap it up from everybody. And we will be back tomorrow. Um, we're going to cover the end of the day of the trial. I think it would be smart to do five to six. 
Uh, we've had quite a long and fabulous live today, four to six, five to six Eastern, which is uh, eight to nine. Um, sorry, five to six Pacific, which is eight to nine Eastern. I think that would be a good plan if, if everybody's willing to join us, whoever can. Um, so, Dotsie, your final thought. You can unmute. You're still muted. Yeah. Husband's cooking dinner in there, so it's a little loud. I, I'm in fight mode after being on this panel for the last couple of hours. I mean, I, that's just, it's, it's, it, that's, that's how I feel. I'm just like, go get them, go fire. I'll be on for 10 hours tomorrow if you want, Jane. Like, we, we are, we are stronger together and the, the 95%, they, they, they got nothing on, on these two ladies and, and Wayne tomorrow. So let's go get them. I'm so glad you're joining our panel. Mick Davoudian, what is your final thought here? Well, my final thought for today is I think it's been a good day, obviously, looking forward to tomorrow. Um, we'll see how the trial goes. I mean, no matter what happens in this particular case, I think if I'm not mistaken, Jane, you can correct me. There are at least a couple of more trials coming up for this year, if I'm not mistaken. So there's a lot, there's a lot ahead. And as Donnie said, um, the tipping point may be coming soon. Wow. I love it. I love those uh, enthusiastic and positive predictions. All right, Nathan, your, your prediction, your final thought? I'm looking forward to the prosecution um, and Foster Farms being embarrassed by this case. I think, you know, when you listen to Alexandra speak, I can't help but think, I mean, this is a person who just exudes compassion, cares about the planet, cares about all beings, and that is going to shine through. I mean, she's going to be tremendous on the stand. And I, I think they're going to, I, I just, my prediction is they're going, the, they being the prosecution is going to be embarrassed by standing behind these charges. I have to ask you a quick, even though we were rubbing ourselves up into final statements, uh, I uh, want to ask you, she, she mentioned that she's been arrested quite a few times. Is the prosecution going to try to use that against her? Well, an arrest is proof of nothing. Um, you know, you need a conviction with the arrest to be able to bring that to the jury's attention. Um, there may be some, you know, what we call prior bad acts that if the defendants choose to testify, and it sounds like they will, the prosecution might be able to cross-examine on those. But I think, you know, they're going to be cases like this. They're going to be rescue cases. They're going to be protest cases. They're only going to further prove that these are compassionate women who really fight for what they believe in. Um, you know, um, it goes to, it, it gives them credibility on issues like necessity, that this was the only, what else could they do? You know, how do you just how do you just stand by and see all these, you know, these chickens suffering and do nothing about it? And to not only, you know, do it's not even just about doing nothing to criminalize them for that kind of compassion. I, I think it's going to land like a lead balloon like it did in uh, in Utah. And I'm looking forward to it. All right. And Ellen Dent, last but not least. I'm going to say that even though uh, there isn't enough mainstream media coverage on this, that we all have the power to share this trial. We have the power to share this story. Uh, so like you always say, Jane, uh, use your devices, use your social media platforms. It doesn't matter how many followers you have. Get the word out there. We will make sure that they listen to us, but we need everyone to to do what they need to do on an individual basis to get this word out there. And I'm wishing them all the luck in the world with this trial. I hope it's not dismissed. I hope that Foster Farms embarrasses themselves completely. I hope that people see what is happening to these individuals on these trucks and in these slaughterhouses and the farms. Uh, the whole process is completely terrifying, horrifying, and, and no one can imagine living or dying the way that these individuals do. So good luck to Alexander Andrew Paul and Alicia Santrino, um, Santrino, uh, I wish them all luck. So thank you. Wow. And uh, did you get your final thought, Donnie? 
Oh, uh, well, uh, two quick final thoughts. The first is, I know you can't show it uh, for fear of having the whole thing taken down, but I would encourage people to go to YouTube and look at footage of Foster Farm so that, you know, they said so people can see what you were unable to show. Um, and the second point that I would make, want to make is that about 18 years ago, I was on a hike with the CEO of Foster Farms and his husband. I had just become vegan just a couple of months before, but I was not yet an animal rights activist. And I could remember them ridiculing animal rights activists and saying, don't these people have anything better to do with their time? And I remember thinking to myself, I have a feeling I'm going to be one of those people soon. Like I felt it was like running through my my veins. And uh, I wonder what they're thinking now, you know, that they see these extraordinary women who have made the sacrifice and who are so courage and so thoughtful and so smart. Uh, these are the people that that he was de that they were denigrating. Well, and we we will say we invite Foster Farms on anytime. Uh, we put up their statement that they gave to the New York Times. We would love to dialogue with you. And um, absolutely, last, last, last but not least, the amazing Carla, who is now <laughs> driving to a different location, which you you are really the intrepid reporter. I don't want you to hurt yourself. I don't want you to comment while you're driving. Be I'm safe. not driving. I'm not oh, driving. <laughs> what are you doing? Pretending to drive? No, I, I drove and now I'm at the other location. So I'm oh, stopped. I'm just sitting in my car. Oh, is there a protest going on there? Uh, not yet, but there will be uh, soon after after this. Well, I want to take a quick vote because you're our incredible panel. I mean, thank you so much. I know it's a lot of time and effort. Um, what do you think, Carla? Should we go four to six tomorrow or five to six? What is Because you've got the best read on this. I would say that uh, knowing what we learned today, I think five to six is probably going to be good. Okay. And you'll be there and we'll get the statements coming out of court. You've done an amazing job. Can we all get, just give a round of applause to Carla? Uh, honestly, to, by tomorrow she'll be gone. There'll be a network will have snapped her up. So let's hope we have her tomorrow. We'll see you at 5 p.m. Pacific. 8 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. That is Wednesday. And please, as we sign off, my final comment is, and it's not a selfish comment because I don't consider this my app that I created. It is a community app, Unchained TV, the world's only free nonprofit global streaming TV network for animal rights and the plant-based lifestyle. It is 100% free to download. You can download it right now on your phone. Um, and we like you to register with your email, but you don't have to, but we prefer that. Unchained TV, you can also get it on your Apple TV device. You can get it on your television via Amazon Fire Stick, via your Roku device, and soon to be on um, all Samsung TVs. You can also go to unchainedtv.com and watch it there. Please download it because we do all this work, but we do need the support of the compassionate community because we don't have millions of dollars to do marketing campaigns. All right. So thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow. <sighs> wow. What a day. Bye.